चाइल्ड हेल्थ आई वेलकम एवरी वन टू दिस बी एल के टेलीपीड्स वेबिनार सीरीज सो टूडे वी ब्रिंग यू एन एद इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक ऑफ प्रैक्टिकल इम्पोर्टेंस एंड टू चेयर द सेशन वी हैव विद अस डॉक्टर विनीत सैगल सर इज एसोसिएट डायरेक्टर पीडियाट्रिक्स मैक्स सुपर स्पेशलिटी हॉस्पिटल शालीमार बाग न्यू डेली and he has 25 year more than 25 years of experience in pediatric practice and pediatric respirology and areas of special interest are pediatric respirology exercise physiology and long distance running and sir has been a master trainer of iap modules atm arctm rti gem etc past president of uh, pediatric respiratory society delhi also past secretary iap national respiratory chapter uh, welcome to you sir and we have our other chairperson dr rachna sharma she is the director and in charge of the pediatric intensive care unit at blk max super specialty hospital and she is the director of fellowship program which is run, uh, under the aegis of iap idp ccm also uh, the center is running successful training program for pediatric critical care nursing and ma'am is secretary delhi iap intensive care chapter and also affiliated with pedistars and qualified pedistars instructor welcome to you ma'am i now request our chairpersons to introduce our speaker and begin the session over to you sir dr rachna i think you might be the right person <laughs> to introduce them because you are working with them please go ahead rachna okay sir uh, so dr ravi bharatwaj has recently joined us as a pediatric gastroenterologist and hepatologist he has uh, he has done his fellowship from uh, apollo hospital and uh, Uh, he's right now uh, presently he's working with us for last one year his special areas of interest are pediatric liver transplant therapeutic and diagnostic endoscopic procedures and metabolic liver disease over to you dr ravi dr ravi you can now share your slides yeah ma'am i'll share Can you see my screens, ma'am? Yeah, we can see this. Yeah. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, and thank you for having me here. Uh, thank you, Rachna, ma'am, Doctor Swati, uh, uh, Vineet sir, and uh, other BLK uh, telepeds group. So, uh, I our topic of discussion today is foreign body in GI tract. So, okay, very are... PowerPoint, sir. Just. हेलो पावर पॉइंट कर दीजिए इट्स ओके नो या या सो आर टॉपिक टुडे इज फॉरेन बॉडीज सो स्टार्टिंग विद अ फॉरेन बॉडी एनीथिंग दैट कैन बी इंजेस्टेड that can be swallowed other than the uh, you know edible substances can be a candidate for potential foreign body so you can see the list of foreign bodies there are coins there are button batteries toys and the parts of toys including lead batteries and others there can be magnets single or multiple magnets safety pins screws marbles bones uh food boluses so you can see practically everything like pearls uh ear ring nose ring anything that can be you know uh, something that is not edible and that can be ingested or swallowed can be a, you know uh, termed foreign body so to start our presentation so uh, i would like to mainly highlight the important points here so that we you know uh, there are minimalistic uh, confounding factors and we straight away know what are the you know take away points here so i would like to start my presentation uh, with what is dangerous so these are few dangerous foreign bodies how and what makes them dangerous that, that is our part of discussion later on also 
so you can see any sharps screw nail pin hair pin uh, this is like neo neodymium magnets these are called earth magnets which are uh, you know high uh, capacity how strong magnets they are these are button batteries this is more than one magnet so these are especially the five subgroups five groups that are called uh, dangerous foreign bodies so whenever a foreign body is ingested there are few questions that we should ask it's like a you know common sense questions there is guidelines you know sometimes they are difficult to remember they keep on changing but the basic pathology the basic outline that remains the same so uh, whenever there is foreign body so always like the other questions means what is it and what is the timing of foreign body ingestion so if it is a dangerous foreign body as we saw previously then better uh, uh, patient should be evaluated if it is it doesn't come in dangerous foreign bodies then i think patient can be reassured and you can you know uh, continue your evaluation and you can do according to the type of foreign body so after uh, what it is and how much time has elapsed after ingestion of foreign body the second pertinent question is where it's now so child is already you know accidentally swallowed foreign body so uh, where it is now so if it is in esophagus so you get the idea that the foreign body is in uh, esophagus so it might need removal especially when it is stuck for a uh, few hours especially more than 12 hours in his stomach you can wait for most of the foreign body except for the dangerous foreign body see dangerous foreign body i showed you the first picture because in most of the condition the these dangerous foreign bodies they should be evaluated the uh, immediately and the uh, effort should be made to recover them from food threat. So, duodenum, if it is in duodenum, the most will pass safely. The second uh, set of questions that we are going to ask is how it's going to. So, these slides we are going to, after the our presentation is over, we can just go through these two slides so that we, uh, we can, you know, correlate uh, our learning with these questions. So how it's going to harm now for foreign body like mechanical injury with the shock, if some screw is there, if the open hairpin is there. So uh, it can directly damage the esophageal lining, the stomach lining. It can later on, you know, perforate intestine or any part of uh, food tract or GI tract that it comes in contact with. Uh, whether it is lost in esophagus, or does this foreign body contain anything chemical? So it might later cause or immediately cause chemical burns. Like many of the button batteries, especially the lead batteries, they have uh, sodium hydroxide inside them. So once you know the current is in, you know, they, they are activated when they come in contact. So they tend to cause chemical burns also as the time elapses after ingestion. So after it's going to harm now, the second question is whether it's going to harm later because just because the foreign body is not causing any damage now or there is no, uh, you know, symptoms now, it doesn't mean that it is not going to cause harm later. So, for example, if the child is, you know, having a button battery, very small button battery, less than 10 mm, maybe initially there is not such harm, but later on as the, you know, caustic substances are released, that might cause harm some other batteries also they might cause harm something you know the lead batteries they might release a lead inside the blood and sometimes after the you know ingestion of lead batteries in immediately in few hours the lead spike is there so lead blood lead level increases so increase in size so you can see there are diapers there are some toys in which there are polyabsorbent material which increases in size after absorption of fluid so for example if the child is you know just eating the diaper itself doesn't look you know harmful uh, at the first onset but they contains these super absorbent polymers granules so once they are inside they tend to soak water and increase in size increase in size so 
they can increase in size uh, as high as maybe uh, 10 to 30 times of their original size and that might lead to intestinal obstruction and perforation. So again, there is one more, uh, there is change in shape. So the foreign body that you initially consider is like round, which is not containing sharp. Can it turn into shape? Can, can it change its shape? So like there is fidget spinner, it has variable parts, it has radio lucent part and radio opaque parts also. So maybe after it is inside the stomach, it disintegrates and uh, you know, th that there are sharp uh, points also, there are uh, metal parts that is, you know, released in the intestine. So there is possibility of change in shape also. Mm -hmm. And the third, uh, and the last question that you have to consider and you have to ask yourself and the patient also, that whether there are any underlying factors, any predisposing uh, factors or remote consequences uh, of this foreign body. Like in cases of button battery or some chemical injury, later on there might be some stricture. If there are some underlying factors which predispose child to a retention of foreign body, some of them might be there, some congenital, uh, you know, abnormality, some eosinophilic esophagitis, eso uh, esophageal stricture can be there, some malrotation or stenosis. So some something you know causing obstruction or something causing hindrance in uh, forward movement of foreign body might be responsible for retention of foreign body. So uh, uh, esophagus is not a straight tube because sometimes you know from uh, looking at the esophagus it, it looks like that why is the foreign body here? Why doesn't it go directly to the stomach when it is passing through a tube? So there are areas of physiological narrowing, plus there is esophagus itself has its own motility. So uh, there are predominantly three areas of narrowing. One is related to upper esophageal sphincter that correspond to cricopharyngeus muscles. The second one is at the level of, level of aortic arch. And the third uh, is at the level of lower esophageal sphincter. So you can correlate with the diagrams here. So the first one is at the level of, you know, uh, upper esophageal sphincter. If you, uh, this, uh, this uh, correspond to the, uh, this uh, opacity around, in between clavicle or just above the clavicles. And uh, this, this relates to the cricopharyngeal muscles. So this is like mid esophagus. The maximum foreign bodies are trapped on upper esophageal sphincter. Approximately 15% of them, they, they, they are stuck on at the level of uh, aortic arch, which is mid esophagus. And third one is just above the stomach gas shadow. You can see there is a coin again. So this is like uh, lower esophageal sphincter. So mid esoph the the highest probability of the point to you know spontaneously pass in stomach is with the lower esophageal junction the least possibility for spontaneous migration of coin or foreign body is when it is stuck at uh, upper esophageal sphincter so what happens next once they are in esophagus or in stomach? So most of the ingested foreign bodies, they'll pass spontaneously. Only 10 to 20% of them, including the dangerous foreign bodies, they'll require endoscopic removal. Less than 1%. In some studies, even less than 0.5%, they'll require surgical intervention. So for foreign bodies, uh, the... There is a old saying which usually is quite helpful when we look at the radiography when we sus uh, when we have a suspicion of foreign body. So the old saying is the eyes are useless when the mind is blind. So there are few uh, artifacts. There are few you know uh, things that that if you your mind knows you can see them on X ray also. So, for example, there are radiolucent foreign bodies also. So, suppose the child uh, has taken not a metallic, sp uh, metallic spoon, in spite, uh, instead of that, he has taken a plastic spoon. So, that might not be visible on uh, X-ray or there might be some outlining or some, you know, uh, different types of less uh, opaque shadow on uh, X-ray. 
there might be foreign bodies with non specific symptoms non specific means there will be symptom but not related to the stomach or uh, gi tract they there might be symptoms like drooling of saliva there might be symptoms like retroesternal burning pain there there might be lethargy uh, signs of dehydration so these are some non specific symptoms are there there might be other symptoms sometimes like a child who is who doesn't have any explanation for refusal to eat and he suddenly you know refuses to eat anything there might there there might be confounding factors like upper respiratory symptoms so drooling of child the coughing of child that might be mistaken for laryngoepiglottitis the there can be remote damage like the when the lead is you know spilled into the body there might be uh, altered sensorium there might be acute lead toxicity uh, symptoms also if the nickel battery is there there might be rashes there or nickel hypersensitivity might be there so same goes for the uh, ingredients what is there inside so this is uh, for the atypical symptoms uh, with foreign bodies and you can see that this child who has uh, two days of drooling of saliva and uh, in spite of nebulization the oxygen support everything you know uh, what, uh, what was expected in view of upper respiratory thing everything was done but child continued to have these symptoms along with the strider also he uh, you know started having that then uh, we did the upper gi endoscopy so this was a child who has a food bolus which was impacted uh, at the lower esophageal sphincter and as you can see as it you know it soaked water inside and it grew and it snugly fitted into uh, esophagus causing it complete blockage of uh, esophageal uh, esophageal lumen so that led to you know this haziness lot of secretions drooling so we you know uh, dislodge this from the esophagus uh, directed food bolus to stomach because it is difficult to catch them in esophagus when they are so snugly fit and then we remove it out with the help of rothnet forcep so again these 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 are the things that that might be mistaken you know uh, for a the coin might be mistaken for a button battery and at the same time button battery that might be mistaken for a coin so you can see there is a distinctive two tier profile or a circle within a circle appearance when it is a button battery uh, in a coin there is usually you know there is a homogeneous appearance and the second thing is okay, there is one more thing that you can notice in this x ray that the x ray usually should be taken from nasopharynx to anus because uh, when there is one foreign body in 10% of the children there might be another foreign body in the digestive tract or maybe simultaneously in the uh, you know uh, the respiratory tract also so this is important because the coin and battery uh, management button battery ingestion both are differently managed uh, one one for coin you can have a expectant management for a quite long but at the same time in button battery after 2 to 4 hours of ingestion or stay in esophagus it you know increase the severity increases so uh, in case of magnet again there the you can see on the left hand side there is it looks like that there is one magnet bead one magnet bead such a small size doesn't cause any symptoms maybe it is you know it, it should pass out spontaneously but when you look at the right side you can see on the lateral x-ray there, there is superimposition and what you are seeing at one magnet is actually beads of two magnets so Whenever there are multiple magnets, they that make it is a make it a you know candidate for urgent removal or at least heightened vigilance because the the intestinal wall might be compressed between them and mesenterial artery, mesenterial uh, vascular su supply can also be compromised, leading to ischemia, perforation, any fistula formation, outside tract formation also. So. Uh, this is a child who has a uh, magnet ingestion and uh, the x-ray it was showing two magnets
this is not playing. Let us see if we are able to play. Otherwise, we'll just pass. Okay, we'll uh, see it again. So, esophagus uh, for coin, the spontaneous passage is uh, more common in older children, and especially as we discussed earlier, when it is in distal third, uh, there are chances that the foreign body will pass uh, spontaneously in the stomach. So, 20 to 30 percent of the foreign bodies they pass into the stomach spontaneously in the first 24 hours of their stay in esophagus, and out of those 20 to 30 percent. Around two third of them, they pass in first eight hours. So when the coin is in the stomach, it is managed expectantly, and vast majority of them will pass out uneventfully within seven to ten days, mostly fourteen days, and the maximum wait time has been four weeks. Usually, it doesn't cause any damage till then. So coin is stuck at EUS. Usually, this is the uh, uh, usual removal that we do. Uh, it, it is removed with the help of red tooth forcep. So long and blunt objects, there are toothbrushes, batteries, and spoons. They doesn't come into sharps. So, uh, and they doesn't behave same for, you know, for the younger children and older children, because the size of the lumen also matters in these long subjects, long objects. So when the child is more than five years, the child is adolescent, object five centimeter or longer in the stomach, they, they should be removed. For the younger children, when uh, especially less than five years, the object which are longer than 2.5 centimeter should be removed endoscopically. Later on, they might cause obstruction. So button battery, this needs a special mention as it is one of the most harmful uh, and uh, most harmful foreign body that we see in our day-to-day -day practice and its use is uh, uh, increasing day by day in toys, in watches and so many of our new electric, uh, new gadgets. So this is the sch schematic diagram of button battery. You can see it has a cathode, anode, there is electrolyte soaked separator, the top is there, there is a seal for liquid, and inside there might be a potassium or sodium hydroxide solution also. That is especially the electros, electrolyte soap separator. Usually it contains potassium or sodium hydroxide. So the, me uh, the mechanism of injury is when the circuit is completed, when the both sides are in contact with uh, esophageal lumen, the cathode and anode, at that time, there is electrical current that passes through mucosa that causes uh, necrosis. And uh, after the necrosis, when the, the battery is you know stuck to the wall of esophagus, there is pressure necrosis above that, other than the coagulative necrosis. And after that, once the uh, this uh, caustic soda and uh, sodium potassium hydroxide, this is released, then there is you know, caustic injury again over that. So it's a three prongs attack, which led to injury in button battery. So there are variables through which you can predict the button battery, the severity of button battery damage. So first of them, the one, the important one of them, which is the, you know, type of button battery, if they are lithium battery, lithium, the new energy storage molecules, it has capacity to, you know, uh, contain, you know, they have high capacitance, so higher volt voltage is there, higher electricity is, current is there. So lithium batteries, they causes the most damage. The battery charge stays, the new batteries, more than 20 mm in diameter, they have, uh, you know, more capacitance and more energy stored inside them, causing more damage. The time of ingestion, Especially after two to four hours, in cases of button battery, the injury progresses, you know, quite substantially after that. Number of batteries, as the name itself suggests, when more is the number of batteries, more is the injuries. The magnet co-ingestion, again, this is like double attack. There, there, is, there can be injury because of the magnet. So in cases of magnet, especially when there are the new earth magnets or new strong magnets, they can cause injury while coming in the contact of outside uh, 
you know uh, outside metallic surface also like the buckle of belt if there are some you know uh, metallic buttons some metallic things that you come in contact with so all these things they might also cause that is why we mostly most of the time when there is confusion we avoid mri in foreign body and instead go for ct scan so bowel necrosis and perforation if there is magnet co-ingestion with the uh, button battery and if there is any underlying history of esophageal anomaly structure or surgery because then then it will cause you know the retention of button battery and uh, further injury so uh, what as a uh, you know caretaker as a first uh, doctor that the parent uh, that the patient comes to you and so what you could do at OPD at home, what can be done as a first aid is when the button battery ingestion is there, if the child has, you know, if the parents or somebody has witnessed the uh, ingestion or it has occurred within the 12 hours, what you can do is you can give a pure dose of, uh, pure oral dose of honey around 5 to 10 ml. And once you reach the emergency department, the another uh, uh, dose of honey can be given or single dose of sucral fat can be given. How does it help? It just coated, uh, coats the uh, walls of esophagus and decreases the injury. There has been uh, animal models who support this thesis. And the only uh, thing that we are worried is because when the child will, uh, when the child is going to require sedation for removal of button battery at that time, there might be risk of aspiration. But as compared to the injury that it causes, the risk of aspiration is considered negligible as compared to the, the injury that it might cause when it stays inside. So when there is delayed recognition of button battery ingestion, especially when it is found out after 12 hours or you it is found out incidentally on the evaluation for other uh, atypical causes, the advice is to avoid any oral intake until the evaluation and management is complete. So this, this was a button battery that we removed after 12 hours and because of the food, we have to do a lot of work for this. This, I'm not able to play the videos. So I'll just try and see whether they could be played request Ankit sir to continue with the presentation. Before that, I'll just uh, uh, re-emphasize the takeaway points. So takeaway points, instead of any guidelines, I would say go, go with your common sense, go with your flow. Like you ask question in any blockage, any even if your drains, drains are blocked, means in any case you ask question what, what, what why it is blocked, what is causing the block, where is the block, what are the effects of block, how can you remove the block, what are the exit path of that, and what are the probable risks that can be encountered, encountered during this. Again, there is high suspicion for atypical symptoms, especially when there are upper, G, upper respiratory symptoms which are not responding to your usual treatment because the most of the death or uh, the complication secondary to button battery have occurred when they, this, the, the incident is unwitnessed and the, the, uh, the child directly comes into shock and later on the button battery and some cause is found out. And the third thing is keep dangerous object or patient risk factors in mind. So the dangerous object as we have discussed, so you have to keep these dangerous objects in your mind because when the dangerous objects are there, then it's better to start evaluation uh, at the onset itself. So thank you very much for your patient listening. I'll ask Ankit sir to continue with the presentation. Meanwhile, I'll just try to fix if I could uh, get the videos moving.
so dr ravi you have to sh uh, stop sharing yes sir i'm just stop For the second talk, I would now request uh, our chairpersons to kindly introduce our next speaker. Dr. Dr. Ankit needs no introduction. He is now a veteran, both at BLK and in the pediatric pulmonology uh, circles in Delhi at least. He is well trained in bronchoscopy interventional bronchoscopy, sleep medicine. He's also doing a lot of allergy testing. And he's my go-to person whenever I am in a tight spot. So I grab hold of Ankit then hand over my patients to him. And I'm sure most of you do that. Very dynamic person. Over to you, Ankit. So uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. And... Uh... I'll briefly talk about airway foreign bodies uh, in children. So, uh, uh, when do you need to suspect the foreign body aspiration in children? And what are the clinical signs which are going to help you? And what would you find in radiology? So, I'll just try and summarize this in the first uh, three, four slides. And then I'll try and show you some cases which can um, help us understand this, this topic better. And in the end, we'll, we'll try and summarize, you know, what are the modalities which are used to extract the foreign body from the pediatric AV. Now, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Ravi spoke to you about GI foreign bodies, well, any foreign body which is there uh, inside the pediatric airway uh, has to be removed. There is, there is no other choice. Uh, except for that, uh, uh, you have a foreign body which gets automatically expelled. That is a totally different situation. Now, uh, uh, so let's imagine a peanut and usually a small piece of or the kernel of peanut gets stuck at the subglottic area. Uh, so that will lead to presence of strider and respiratory distress and you will have a history of aspiration and choking uh there would be difficulty in breathing and the patient usually has a weak voice and a weak cry so strider with a weak cry with respiratory distress is actually a subglottic foreign body and remember that in in all these situations your radiology is going to be normal right so uh x-ray in these situations won't help it is the it is the clinical picture which is going to help you now, supposing this, this peanuts get lodged in the trachea, so again, you'll have history of aspiration and choking. There would be respiratory distress and wheezing. So remember that tracheal foreign bodies are large foreign bodies. They're large because they, they are unable to actually enter into one of these bronchus, right? And in this situation, you will have children who are having distress. They will have strider. They will have a monophonic wheeze. And again, they would have mostly normal x-rays because what happens is that the air can go in and it can come back as, as shown in this picture because there's a partial obstruction. So again, the x-rays would be normal and, and, and normal x-rays actually do not exclude a foreign body in these situations. So subglottic and tracheal foreign bodies, both they're sick children who need urgent interventions and they have normal x-rays. Now, the third situation could be when this peanut actually lodges in, in one of the bronchi. So again, the history is going to be similar. But now on examination, you will find that the child has a reduced air entry on the side where the foreign body is lodged. So supposingly it is lodged in the left main bronchus. So the left side air entry would be reduced and you will find a monophonic wheeze there. And in these situations, usually the radiology will shows you uh, will show you hyperinflation uh, because the air can enter in, but the air cannot go out, right? So that is usually the 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 mechanism by which uh, uh, you find hyperinflation to be there. But in situations where uh, the the edema increases or the foreign body is large, the the air cannot enter in, 
So as shown in the stop valve mechanism, the air cannot actually enter in. And in these situations, you will find an ipsilateral collapse. But the side where the air entry is reduced is the side where the foreign body is actually lodged. Now with this background, uh, uh, let's see some of the cases which will help you to, to understand uh, how foreign bodies would be there in children. So it could be an acute presentation when, when parents would rush into you and say, you know, the, uh, this is something which has happened. And this is a very, very, very common scenario, which you will see sometimes in the OPD, especially in the winters. So uh, an 18 month old boy eating peanuts got choked. And this is followed by respiratory distress. So uh, the child was eating peanuts and, and, and then the parents found that, you know, the child turned blue. The child was not able to breathe for a few seconds. And, and then when you examine this child, there's a reduced air entry on the left side and there's a monophonic wheeze. And if you look at this X-ray, then the, then the left side shows hyperinflation, right? So this is a very classical picture, which you would see. And, and it is difficult to miss this. Now let's look at another case scenario. So this is, this is again a toddler who had a history of aspiration of a gram seed uh, early morning, right? So this child developed noisy breathing and respiratory distress. On examination, this child is having a respiratory rate which is high, suprasternal and subcostal retraction and bilateral air entry is reduced. So, so what, what's going on? Why is the bilateral air entry reduced? Why is this child so sick? Okay, so uh, this is the X-ray of this child. And if you look at this X-ray, then there's hyperinflation on the left side. The, this part of the area also appears more black and, and something going on here. So is it actually a pneumonia which is there? Is it actually a foreign body? Well, the, the, the history was so strong that we, we had to do a bronchoscopy to see what's going on. And if you look at this bronchoscopy video, then you can immediately see a foreign body there in the right main bronchus. But when you turn onto the left side, you also see a foreign body on the left side as well. So this child actually had foreign body on both sides, right? So you can see this is the foreign body on the right side. And this is the dormia basket, which we have passed through the channel of the bronchoscope, which is used to extract the foreign body. So when these foreign bodies are, you know, eaten, uh, and that is true for most of these organic foreign bodies, they, they can actually, you know, you know, break into pieces. So you can see this dormia, which is, which is now, uh, capturing the body, and then we come out with the domia and the bronchoscope to drain the body. Bile body sometimes can be a problem, <clears throat> and and these children could be terribly sick because they have no space to breathe. Uh, this is another recent child, which uh, which was a bit unusual. So this child choked after eating a pomegranate, right? And this is a recent child. And that happened in daycare and, and the child was rushed to, to the hospital casualty. The child was quite sick in the casualty and had to be intubated and ventilated, right? Uh, and when I got a call, the child was already on the ventilator and the air entry was absent on the left side. And this is the X-ray which you can see. So this is a complete collapse of the left side. And, uh, and this, this happens because of the mechanism which I had shown you. Uh, because sometimes the foreign body is large or the foreign body uh, has led to an edema, uh, there's a complete blockage to the bronchus. So what do we do with the ventilator? It is a difficult situation. So we we, we went actually to the OT with, with, with everything in place. Uh, we took out the endotracheal tube, put on an LMA, a laryngeal mask, and through that we did a flexible bronchoscopy. There was a peep, uh, the whole promigranate which was there in the, uh, in the left main bronchus, as you see in this image. Uh, so this is the pomegranate which was there, and and this is what we extracted. Um, the lung expanded, and the child got discharged the next day. So it can be an acute, life-threatening event situation. But sometimes the situation can be. Fishy. So, for example, this child was referred to us uh, as a clear-cut case of foreign body, two years old, uh, three, four days history of fever and cough and distress. 
and the child choking after a history of peanuts. So when this child came, this child was having a saturation which was quite low. It was something like 80-82%. Uh, there's hyperinflation on the right side. If you look at the left side, then, then there's a collapse. So we thought that there might be, you know, multiple pieces of peanut which are there in the left side. So uh, this child was taken immediately to the ICU, quite sick. We, we, we arranged everything to remove the foreign body. And when we went down, actually, there was no foreign body which we could see. Uh, there was a lot of mucus which was there and there were some membranes which were there which uh, which, which which we tried and removed. So we thought that there's a foreign body beyond the, 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 the mucus which we are seeing and that is what came out. So it was a, uh, it was a plastic bronchitis that was actually mimicking a foreign body aspiration. So we removed this and, and uh, when we sent the bowel for analysis, it was actually positive for a Boca virus. So actually, it was a Boca virus induced plastic bronchitis, which was mimicking a foreign body. So a, a, a bronchoscopy in this situation can actually help to, you know, uh, make a diagnosis and do the therapeutic work as well. So this child uh, was then uh, kept on the ventilator for a day or two because this child was having still having respiratory distress and wheezing, gradually settled down, extubated and discharged. But you can have non-organic foreign bodies as well. And again, uh, this is an eight years old was playing with a whistle in the mouth, right? Uh, and, and when that happened, this child actually aspirated the foreign body. Uh, and, and this child came with a CT scan, which was showing a foreign body in the trachea. Uh, and so we, we, we actually removed this foreign body using a flexible bronchoscope and a rat put forceps. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll show Show you how this is done. So uh, this is the glottis in the vocal cords which you see. We're putting some xylocaine for local anesthesia, and as we go down, uh, you, you will you will see a foreign body there. So you can see this 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 foreign body. Uh, this is the these are you know parts of the whistle which which you see uh, which have been lodged in the trachea. And again, these children are quite sick, and the, 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 these are slightly older children when, when they are actually you know playing around with the whistle in the mouth. Uh, in this, you cannot use a dormia basket because uh, it is not a roundish foreign body. So usually you need an alligator or rat with forceps which can get hold of this foreign body and remove. Right. So you can very well see uh, the the uh, the parts of the whistle. And this is the rat tooth forceps, which we have passed through the channel of the bronchoscope. And, and this, this helps in, in retrieval, retrieval of the foreign body. Right. Now, and this is the foreign body which we removed. So usually they are, they are in pieces. There are multiple pieces of the, of the whistle which, uh, which is there. Sometimes you can have uh, sharp foreign bodies and this is the foreign body which was removed with a, with a rigid bronchoscope because sometimes sharps are difficult to remove with a flexible bronchoscope. Uh, and this is a recent child which, which, we, which we had and this child was actually undergoing a dental procedure. And during the dental procedure, what was uh, they, they were actually removing a tooth, and this child was was crying, and this child aspirated a tooth, and you can see the tooth in this X-ray. So this is the tooth which is there, possibly in the right main bronchus. This is the tooth which you can see, and this is the foreign body which which we removed. Uh, so this was again uh, with with the help of a flexible bronchoscope in a dormia basket. This is again a recent child. This is approximately a, a one and a half years old child. And they came with a history that this child uh, has eaten a part of a data cable, right? And this was a radio opaque foreign body. So I wasn't very happy with the history that, that this is actually a data cable uh, because we have seen such foreign bodies before. And my hunch was that this is something else. And I thought, this is actually an LED bulb, but uh, the history was this strong that you know, this, this child was actually eating the data cable, and this child then aspirated and choked. 
So we we again did a flexible bronchoscopy and uh, and we actually removed this. So this was, this was actually an LED bulb. So what do you see here in the X-ray? These are the two, you know, the metallic part of the LED bulb, which you see. The whitish part, which you see, which is more of a plastic part, is actually not visualized in the X-ray. So what looks on the X-ray sometimes can be very fallacious. But fortunately, we were able to remove this foreign body with a dark tooth forceps. Now, foreign bodies, you know, we have shown you uh, tracheal foreign bodies and bronchial foreign bodies, but you know, this can sometimes be subglottic. So this child uh, had a history of eating peanuts in the end of December, remained well, admitted outside um, the first week of February for five days with Valery and was discharged but not completely well, right? So slightly longer history, but we, we weren't happy with the history. There's something fishy going on. Again, seen in the third week of February and the child had persisted. Strider again increased, and then we got the child in the end of the at the end of March. So severe respiratory distress, hypoxic child, strider and a weak cry. And as I said, strider with a weak cry, you know, is, is something there in the larynx or the subglottic area. So uh, we went ahead, went to the OT, uh, and we we did a bronchoscopy, and this is this is the bronchoscopy video. So you find a sub foreign body there so this is the glottis and you can see that there's this there's, there's foreign body which is there in between the vocal cords in the subglottic area now this foreign body was removed but after removal of the foreign bodies the the anesthetists were not able to ventilate this gene and we weren't sure what what's going on uh so they said let's do a bronchoscopy again and and this is what we found so yeah we are coming out of the trachea as you can see and as we come out and reach to the subglottic area, this is what we found. So these were, these were large subglottic granulations which were formed uh, because the foreign body was a bit, you know, uh, lodged for a bit of a longer time uh, in the subglottic area. So this child could not be ventilated. So this child was, uh, we put this child on an endotracheal tube, brought this back child back to the ICU, gave this child steroids, waited for 48 hours, extubated this child, did a check bronchoscopy again, and, and the granulations actually had subsided by that time, and this child was extubated and then went home. The subglottic foreign bodies sometimes can be very tricky. Uh, these are two two recent foreign bodies which which we which we uh, encountered. So, medicines uh, there in the house, and this we removed with a flexible scope with the rat put. And this was a foreign body, which was a piece of the bislary seal, which you get. Uh, and we thought that it might be a bit difficult with that. So we took an optical forceps of the, uh, and we took the optical forceps to move this body. Cute foreign bodies sometimes, you know, can give you a bad time. Uh, not just because the extraction is difficult if the child is sick, but sometimes you 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 may not be very clear whether it is a foreign body or not. This eight month old had fever, cough, and distress on examination as a reduced air intake. So what you find on the right side is a, a suboptimal X-ray is there. This child is which is an expiratory film. We understand, but the the resident on duty thought that this is a pneumothorax, and, and I would say that he was he was he was right. So with this reduced air entry and possibly a pneumothorax, a tube was put away. When the tube was put in, the lung collapsed. So why did why that happen? That's, that's not something we should see. If you drain a pneumothorax, the lung would expand. So, you know, everything collapsed. Uh, some serosangular fluid came out, but we weren't very happy. And when we reviewed the child the next day morning on rounds, Actually, the air was reduced on the right side and there was a monophonic wheeze. So that made us suspicious that, you know, there is something wrong which is going on. And when we look at the history uh, on or a, a, a day prior, and this child was also fed. And when we did a bronchoscopy, we actually found a piece of uh, uh, the, the, the con uh, uh, inside the airway, we removed that, and the child became well. So this is an old case when I used to be in Karavati, Southern Children's Hospital. But for more time, you present with some presentations as well. 
So, for example, this child is a one-year-old, one-year-old boy who has noisy breathing and cough for the past one month and keeps on getting respiratory distress. There was no significant history of fever. History of getting, you know, choked after eating a cucumber, that's impossible. So uh, cucumber is soft, it is very difficult to aspirate it. But this child got admitted three times, got antibiotics and bronchodilators. And as per parents, the child has never remained well. So the noisy breathing has been persisting. And you have three set of x-rays which are there. And if you look at these x-rays and, you know, all of them grossly look okay, except for there is some amount of hyperinflation which is seeing. So what's going on? This child is having noisy breathing. This child is not doing well. But this child has normal x-rays. This child is not running fever. So something non-infectious which is going on. History of, you know, um, choking after cucumber doesn't, doesn't impress me at all. So what's going on? And, and obviously, this child deserves a bronchoscopy. So uh, when we did a bronchoscopy, actually, what we found is, is this. So there was a piece of peanut which was there uh, in the trachea. And again, you can see a dormia. And it's in the tubule of the foreign body. So you, you actually need to uh, you know, be, be, be very cautious in these patients that uh, the history is misleading. But the clinical science... Uh, which you see, they're very strong. So despite a normal radiology, despite a longish history, you actually find the body. So the, the, the history has to be taken, the examination has to be done. So the distress which is there, the noisy breathing which is there, the monophonic V's which is there, makes us suspicious about the tracheal foreign body. And as I said, in most of the tracheal foreign bodies, the X-rays are normal. But these are sick children, so you cannot miss them on examination. And, and this three years old had cough and distress for three or four weeks. This child did not improve. But if you look at these x-rays more carefully, this is actually a collapse which is there. So this is a classical middle plus lower lobe collapse, and that happens when there's obstruction to interest, and it is much more prominent in this area. And if it is inside the airway, Rajma, and, and uh, in the intermediate bronchus, and this is the post bronchoscopy exit. So, longer uh, history, a non sick child presenting with a persistent pneumonia or a persistent collapse, think about a foreign body in the airway. This is again a very interesting patient, which which was there. Uh, uh, they were residents of Delhi, but they were staying in Chennai for a while. And this one-year-old boy had fever and cough. Right, so no history of aspiration or choking. Now admitted outside, received antibiotics. The fever improved, but you know, off and on it was there. The cough is persisting. Right, and you have an X-ray which is here, and you have a CT which is here, and this CT was reported to be a Swire James James McLeod syndrome. So, Swire James McLeod syndrome uh, happens in a child which has a small hyperleucent lung. Well, this is against that. This is against that. You What you actually have is a unilateral hyperleucent lung which is hyperinflated. So, it is actually not like a Swire James McLeod syndrome. And if you look at this child carefully, there's a reduced air entry on the right side. And if you look at the CT scan more carefully, there is something in the right main bronchus which is which is obstructing it. So it was a possible foreign body. We did a bronchoscopy, and 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 uh, what you what you found is 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 very interesting. We we removed it for the first very time, and we haven't done that again. So you you find a foreign body which is lodged. It was a blackish foreign body which which we weren't sure what it is, but when we actually removed it, this is what we got so it was actually a clove which we which we removed uh it was a whole clove long which which we removed so uh these longer foreign bodies could be sometimes very tricky and this is the last case so 11 years old boy presented way back uh, recurrent episodes of cough fever and, and fast breathing for the past five years mm -hmm. has received att twice 2006 and 2011 why? Because radiological opacity is some amount of fever, cough, and respiratory distress, but the radiological episode uh, opacities keep on increasing, right? So you 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 have these sets of X-rays. Two thousand five, 
a normal looking x-ray. 2006, you find a right lower lobe pneumonia. 2009, what you find is that gradually the right lung is getting collapsed. 2011, the collapse is more prominent. The left lung appears to be hyperinflated. And 2012, the right lung is totally gone. So this is, this is unlike a tuberculosis, which is there. So this child underwent further evaluation. And what you find is there's a foreign body in the right lower lobe bronchus. But, but by that time, the whole of the right lung actually has become bronchiectetic. Right? So it is an old foreign body, which is, which is leading to persistent pneumonia and bronchiectasis. And we actually had to remove the right lung. So underwent a pneumonectomy uh, because of uh, this bronchiectetic lung. Now, uh, let's let's summarize uh, uh, what we have you know uh, talked about. So the most common symptoms would be you know a witnessed choking episode. And remember that if you find choking, that actually means that there is something which has gone beyond the glottis, right? So, so choking is is something which you should elicit. And if you find that uh, uh, a child has choked after eating something which which can be aspirated the possibility of this being a foreign body is more than 80%. Children can present with cough, they can present with fever, low saturations, difficulty in breathing, localized decreased in breath sounds. They can present with a localized wheeze, creps. Sometimes they can be a normal auscultation. So these are the most important uh, symptoms which you would get. Now, on examination, localized air trapping is something which is common, so hyperinflation of an area of the lung. Sometimes they can be atelectasis, as I have shown you in one of the x-rays. They can be local infiltrates. They can be a mediastinal shift. Sometimes you would see a radiopaque foreign bodies. But remember that in 30% of patients, the x-rays are normal. So normal radiology does not rule out an airway foreign body. So how do we remove foreign bodies in children? Well. Uh, we most frequently now use a flexible bronchoscope and we have many tools with which we can which we can remove foreign bodies, but there are situations when a rigid bronchoscopy needs to be done. So the advantages of doing a flexible foreign body uh, extraction are that they can be performed under some sedation and analgesia safely in the PICU. So I don't need to carry this child to, to the OT, which sometimes can be a bit difficult. It's scary for parents and the child itself. You can access the segmental and the subsegmental bronchi. So many a times what you find is that you, you find three or four pieces of a peanut or an almond which are there because they are bitten and broken into many pieces. And when they lodge into smaller uh, you know, airways, a rigid bronchoscopy cannot remove these pieces. Right. So flexible is very helpful in these situations. It can be quite helpful in the diagnosis of other conditions. So, for example, you did not find a foreign body. You actually found a Boca virus plastic bronchitis. And it actually helped in diagnosis. And it also helped in, in, in the therapeutics by removing uh, the cast which was there. Now we have a wide range of equipments which are available. And it markedly reduces the cost. So, it, it reduces the cost almost by, you know, as... 70 to 75 percent as compared to a rigid bronchoscopy. Uh, so these are the tools which we have. So we have baskets of many sizes and shapes. It could be four wire baskets, three wire baskets. It could be with tip, without tip baskets. We increasingly are using rat tooth forceps. Uh, they're usually 2 mm forceps. And now we, we, we have a new tool which is available uh, to us for a uh, 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 in the in the past few years, which is your cryoprobe. So the cryoprobe can be you know passed through a bronchoscope which has a two mm channel, and that can be very helpful in retrieval of foreign bodies, especially which are organic foreign bodies. Uh, but rigid bronchoscopy obviously has a role. Uh, it has a wide working channel and it permits good ventilation. So these are the ventilating bronchoscopes. It has a you know it has a conduit, it acts as a conduit through which the foreign body can be removed. And the uh, rigid bronchoscopes are also available in various sizes. They, they have very good optical telescopes for vis visualization. And there are uh, you know, optical forceps which can be removed for uh, foreign body extraction. And uh, so we, we, had a, we had a child who presented with magnet in the right main bronchus. We could not remove that foreign body with the help of uh, the uh, 
flexible scope, we went ahead, did a rigid bronchoscopy, even with the help of optical telescope, we, 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 we could not remove it. So we actually had to resort to, you know, non-optical forceps, which are much more sturdy and remove the foreign body. So this is a, uh, this is a rigid bronchoscope, which you can see it is a hard ventilating tube. It requires general anesthesia and the child to be taken to OT. Uh, and uh, this is an optical forceps, which you see. So the, there's, there's a forceps uh, and, and uh, through the forceps, you actually pass in your telescope. Uh, and then this is the assembly. And you can see that the, the, the jaws of the optical forceps, they are, they are definitely more sturdy as compared to the jaws of the rat tooth forceps, which we use through our bronchoscope. So the take home messages are that, you know, the, the aspiration of airway foreign bodies is a common occurrence in, in children, especially less than five years of age. So in acute situations, consider a foreign body. If you find that there's a history of aspiration, choking, unilateral signs, monophonic wheezing, or non-response in a wheezy child. Uh, there could be chronic situations which uh, sometimes we get, such as recurrent pneumonias or persistent collapse segments and bronchiectasis. Also do consider a foreign body in these situations. So flexible bronchoscopy under sedation and analgesia is, is a highly effective method of retrieving foreign bodies uh, in pediatric airway. And this is what we do for most of our patients for the past around 10 years. I've been there at BLK Hospital. We can do them easily in, in, in the PICU or in the bronchoscopy room. Uh, the, the hospital stay is, uh, you know, could be as less as one hour. The foreign body is removed. The child comes out of the propofol sedation and goes home directly. Uh, and the cost can be really low. But rigid bronchoscopy does remain uh, the choice if you're looking at sharp foreign bodies or impacted foreign bodies or metallic foreign bodies, uh, and that always remain in our armamentarium. Uh, and and uh, with the availability of good equipment and a good team, especially the ICO team, we are able to do much more therapeutic work. So doing an EBUS guided FNAC, transbronchial lung biopsies, which we do routinely, whole lung lavage, a lot more airway work in the form of balloon dilatation, dealing with growth, granulation, and placement of tracheal and bronchial stents. So uh, the talk cannot end without, uh, you know, thanking my teacher, Professor Varinder Singh, who actually taught me all this, and the ICU team led by Dr. Rachna, Dr. Naresh and Dr. Vibin, who actually promoted all this airway work and the therapeutic work which we do in the PICU. So without their help, uh, without this airway team, actually, we cannot do all this work. So thank you very much. And I'll hand over to uh, the chairpersons. Thank you, Dr. Ankit and Dr. Ravi. You've given us a lot of information to swallow and digest, hopefully not choke on this information. So we can't hear you. Thanks. Rashna, ma'am, would you like to add anything? About an inch. Hello. Sorry, I, I think I got disconnected. I, I was asking Dr. Ravi if I understand right, if uh, ingested ingested foreign body up to an inch of diameter, do we expect it to pass out spontaneously and bigger, one, bigger ones have to be taken out or can even bigger than that pass out spontaneously? Uh, so, sir, actually uh, 2.5 centimeter is uh, actually a cutoff for less than five-year-old child. But... Okay. 
to just to you know add to it uh, it doesn't mean that the foreign bodies which are longer than 2.5 cm cannot pass but definitely there is less probability and once they go out in intestine they might be you know trapped at other location which are difficult to taken out with the help of endoscope right 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 because usually earlier the teaching used to be anything up to a 50 paisa coin size of course the 50 paisa coin size has become smaller and smaller now yes sir almost right. almost uh yeah. those teachings just a very uh just a diversification of those teachings only that is going on very right thank you and i i think batteries are the probably the most dangerous thing and probably yes, the sir. most For common the... things that happen Yes, from gastrointestinal point of view, sir, button battery is uh, one of the most common uh, foreign body that uh, that uh, incurs a lot of uh, normal health and loss of, you know, uh, the damage to mucosa. And at the same time, sharps also sometimes sir, and multiple magnets. Multiple magnets, we have seen two or three cases. Those a child was initially at presentation it was asymptomatic but the, the parents took their time to for decision making and they landed up in perforation itself interesting and do, you, do you get to see tracheoesophageal fistulas also because of these yes sir because of the button batteries there, there is uh, esophageal fistula there is one patient that we two patients that that came for two pediatric surgery uh, because of those fistulas, the underlying cause for them was button battery itself. And so, of uh, course, as... please go ahead, go ahead. So, uh, button batteries can lead to tracheoesophageal fistulas uh, as early as one to two hours. Uh, because of the current which is there, uh, we have seen a few patients, uh, you know, presenting with tracheoesophageal fistulas quite early. They can even perforate into the aorta if, if they perforate posteriorly. So button battery, I think it, it is the worst type of foreign body which, which we encounter. Point taken, point taken. And as uh, mm -hmm. your presentation has shown, Ankit's wide variety that bachche ke haath mein jo bhi mm -hmm. haath mein aa sakta hai, wo muh mein ja sakta hai, aur wo saans ki nali mein ja ke phas sakta hai. Anything is possible. So over to you, Dr. Rachna, for your final comments, yeah. closing comments, Dr. Rachna. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ankit and Dr. Ravi, for a wonderful presentation. And we were quite, uh, there are always dilemmas when it comes to foreign bodies, specifically GI foreign bodies, because most of the time we have an impression that it will pass on and we don't have to do much. But obviously, pointing out that the dangerous foreign body to please should always be very careful. It was quite helpful. And uh, regarding Ankit, I can tell you, that uh, you can always be surprised by the items which can go inside the airway. <laughs> and obviously, they can be very challenging if it's somewhere in the trachea or in the clotted. Then we really, and it's always a, uh, you know, uh, bad for the child. But uh, as a team, we are always, uh, we feel very challenged whenever we are, you know, taking care of the airway simultaneously, putting an LMA and taking out the foreign body. So uh, after, uh, you know, once we have Ankit to do all these things, so it's uh, it's fun. And we always tell Ankit ki ab to winters are hai, so they will be more and more fun parties. Uh, jokes apart. Uh, it was a very lucid presentation. And uh, there's one more thing which I uh, just wanted to say is what about glass? If ever it is ingested, then... Uh, is it? Do you see more of glass for bodies, Doctor? Most of the time, if it is like a piece of glass that has sharp edges, it should be removed mm -hmm. with the help of you know that there are gloves that that there are coats uh, mm -hmm. uh, under those uh, yeah, you know guards that that should taken mm -hmm. out. But sometimes the glass it is like uh, you know the the granules of glass which are mm. difficult to, you know, taken out. And if you suck them with scope, then there are chances that your yeah, scope might also get damaged if there are, you know, okay. there, there are pieces. So better to leave them if they are, you know, finely broken, uh, you know, the evenly spread some granular material. But if mm. there are like pieces of glass with sharps, that then it should be treated as, as a, an, another sharp and should be taken out. Okay. Okay, Dr. Swati. 
Yeah. Uh -huh. So we have come to the end of this session. We like we would like to thank both of our speakers for a very lucid and illustrative presentations. A special thanks to both our chairpersons for their valuable inputs and taking out time for joining us today. And also thanks to all the delegates who joined us. And those who could not join us, the recording of this session would be available on blkpediatricpractice.com and uh, the link will be shared soon. So hope to see you again in continuation of this activity in next month. We will bring you another interesting topic. So till then, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.